Fox News starts right now. The firefighters in shirts dealing with a large brush fire this evening. We first told you about this as breaking news at 5 o'clock today. This is live video from Sky 12 flying above this scene in the 500 block of Highway 78. Yeah, the fire is not as intense as it was during the 5 o'clock news. The fire department posting on Facebook this fire is contained and that the Cibolo Fire Department is there to help out. One of our viewers actually called in and said this is a junkyard. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but no word yet on what started the flames. Again, it's near Highway 78. We're continuing to monitor it. No injuries have been reported. She's in jail facing arson charges, accused of setting fire to her ex-boyfriend's car outside of a Southside motel last May. Karen Salinas was in court today asking for a bond reduction. Paul Venema with what she told the judge and what the judge decided. This Saturday night fire not only destroyed Alejandro Magana's car, it left him and his girlfriend, Karen Salinas, with serious burns. She was hospitalized with burns over 25% of her body. Upon her release from the hospital, she was immediately arrested and jailed. Her bond set at $75,000. The state of Texas versus Karen Salinas. Attorneys, please make your announcements. Salinas' lawyer asked Judge Mesa for a PR bond, then asked Salinas' son to testify. He said the family could not afford the bond and testified that he talked to Magana, who said that the fire was an accident. He was not going to speak, char I mean, speak up pressing charges that she would know as well as um, it was already stated that he was not going to state and speak of any charges. Salinas testified that she was not getting proper medical care in jail. I cannot get um, the adequate medicine for my pain, so pain is always an issue. I asked the guards for my meds. They'll call the nurses, and if the nurses are busy, they just call me whenever. Citing the governor's executive order issued this spring that no PR bonds be set in violent criminal cases, Judge Mesa denied Selena's request. She ordered that the bond remain at $75,000. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. As school districts debate how to reopen this fall, it reignited questions about the effectiveness of masks and whether they are safe to wear throughout the day. Let's separate some of the facts from the fiction now. Here's Ursula Perry. While we've had more than two months of covering up our faces in public, it is fair to say that many of us are used to it by now. But children who've been stuck at home may not be. A viewer contacting us, as schools open up and the state is mandating masks, it is confusing to parents. Some are questioning whether wearing a mask for a long period of time affects oxygen levels. The answer? False. There is no impact on breathing or oxygen levels. Yeah, no hypoxia. We are okay. We've been doing it as physicians for a long time. And it, as long as you're wearing it the right way and it, it's that single cloth, you're going to be just fine. Another question, do cloth masks and bandanas even work to prevent the spread of COVID-19? The answer is true. They do. You don't need a surgical mask. The Center for Disease Control states that using those cloth-based coverings, um, even the homemade ones or the bandanas are providing enough. That said, she says you do need to replace them daily with a clean one. Should you wear a mask while exercising? The answer is yes, particularly if you're working out in an enclosed space like a gym and you can't socially distance. But if your mask gets sweaty or wet, does it still work to prevent the spread of COVID-19? The answer is maybe not. The doctor says you probably need to keep a spare handy. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. We told you earlier this week about major companies getting millions in loans from the Small Business Administration's Paycheck Protection Program. Well, tonight, news of small grants, not loans, through a program on the west side that will become a model for a new effort next week to help micro businesses citywide. Jesse DeGoyato says it actually started out as a way to boost business development on the west side until the pandemic created a more urgent need. City Councilwoman Shirley Gonzalez is trying to help small businesses in District 5 get closer to hitting the mark. Those like air castles on North Salsamora 
Owner Adan Narvaez had been successfully renting out snow cone machines and other party equipment, but not since the pandemic put a stop to parties. So as of right now, we're just trying to hang on for dear life. Everything just canceled. Everything is on hold. The world is on hold right now. Social being marketing lost a third of its business with the city's tourism and hospitality industries, but gained small business clients who weren't online before the pandemic, but who need to now. We pretty much have made up that revenue, but I definitely know that we won't meet our goals this year. But hey, I'm not complaining. That's better than and a lot of other businesses, unfortunately. Each was awarded $5,000 grants to get what they need. Water slides that are in demand and all those computer upgrades. They are micro-businesses with five or fewer employees. They're the ones who are less likely to have uh, relationships with existing banks or lawyers and accountants on staff to immediately help them apply for funds. So Gonzalez says applying for the grants was simple. You just have to show a DBA. You have to show that you have a business uh, in the area and um, that you've been impacted by COVID. You know, I didn't think I was going to get it. I filled it out thinking, well, we'll see what happens and ended up being blessed with it. So I'm thankful. On the west side, Jesse De Goyado, KSAT 12 News. Gonzalez says the funds she set aside for west side businesses are almost depleted, but more will be available through the citywide program that launches next week. For information on that, the District 5 Councilwoman says you can contact Lyft Fund or her office directly. The San Antonio police say they aren't getting much help from a gunshot victim found on the city's northwest side late last night. Officers responded to a motel on Wurzbach Road 910. That was around 11 o'clock. They found the victim who had been shot in the stomach. He was taken to the hospital in critical condition. He was able to speak to police, but they say he wouldn't cooperate. Didn't give them any details on what led up to that shooting. San Antonio police also investigating an apparent rolling shootout late last night on the city's west side. Officers say two people in separate cars were shooting at each other around 1130 on Loop 410 near Calabra. One of the cars had two passengers in it and a bullet grazed a man sitting in the front seat. He was taken to University Hospital where he was treated and then released. Police are looking to see if another shooting victim taken to a different hospital is connected to this shooting. No word on any arrests. In time saver traffic at this hour, let's go to loop 410 at 281. You can see the fly over there. Very light traffic on this Thursday evening. Hopefully a lot of people are home already with a nice ice cold beverage. <laughs> Maybe that's just wishful thinking that on my part. Good. I don't know. The ongoing Black Lives Matter movement has shed light on deep rooted racial and economic disparities throughout the country. This includes the differences in opportunities realized in historically underserved, predominantly minority communities versus affluent communities. District 2 Councilwoman Jada Andrew Sullivan says she has a plan to provide East Side residents with the same access to quality education, health care and other resources that have been lacking in parts of that area for far too long. Here's our Devin Clark. We have to speak to the issues of equality and what that really looks like within uh, the city of San Antonio. It's not difficult to see some of the issues that plague the east side. District 2 Councilwoman Jada Andrew Sullivan says some of the disadvantages stem from practices and policies put in place long ago. The issue of economic segregation and redlining as it pertains to an area that's been underserved and underutilized and um, undeveloped. Now, Andrew Sullivan is hoping to use budget funds to create initiatives that include job and skill training, door-to-door -door healthcare education and testing, and entrepreneurship opportunities, especially self-sustaining businesses that hire people from the community and benefit the community. Even if it's um, producing the, the markets and the community markets and the community stores that we need. Sullivan also wants to make sure that small business owners in the area are financially literate so they know how to access available funding. In the first round of PPP loan programs and the disaster loans and disaster grants, a lot of our small businesses within the district didn't get any of that funding. Part of a plan to achieve equity for all in the area through education, outreach, and services. We have to change the mindset of the people within the community because one thing to things for sure, if you give them something to do and you give them um, the things that they need to thrive, that's what they'll do. Now, these ideas must be voted on by the city's tax increment reinvestment zone board and then the city council as part of next year's budget. If all goes as planned, we could see these resources provided to District 2 as early as next year. Reporting on the east side, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News.
Look outside with live cam this evening. We're down from yesterday, 98 <laughs> instead of 99. Kate. Yes, and it looks like our high temperature for today was 99, just 99. Okay. So one day not in the triple digits, we'll take that because as we get into the weekend, we will be several degrees above 100 degrees as we get into the next few days. So we'll enjoy our 99 today. Decking on the aquifer, it's down half a foot today. The 10 day average down to 659.8 and that is why watering restrictions go in place tomorrow for SAWS customers. We've got a lot of information about this on our website, ksat.com. You can save this image and reference it because it does tell you, depending on your address, what are the days of the week that you can water. A lot of information on ksat.com, and of course, we'll keep you updated. Polling count for today, mold is moderate with a count of 920. More heat on the way. We'll talk about it coming up in just a little bit in the full forecast. One local doctor tells us the challenges his clinics could soon face after the city of San Antonio announced new changes at their testing site. Tonight, the solution he's hoping for. It is time to find out what the numbers may reflect today. We're just moments away from the daily briefing, of course, with Mayor Ron Nirenberg and Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf on the local COVID-19 numbers for today. Yeah, there were more than 800 cases yesterday, so we wait to see. Let's go to City Hall now. Commissioner Justin Rodriguez from Precinct 1, Bear County, as well as Dr. June DeWu, who is the medical director for San Antonio Metro Health, and Dr. Ken Davis, who is the uh, chief medical officer of Christus Santa Rosa. This is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. We continue to emphasize that this virus does not discriminate and we are still in the middle of a pandemic and we do have tonight another 954 new cases of COVID-19 to report in our community. That brings us to a total of 17,679. Tonight we have six new deaths to report and let me take a moment to explain some of the numbers here. Uh, we have uh, Hispanic males, three Hispanic males, uh, one in his 30s, one in his 50s, one in his 70s, and we also have two white females in their 80s and one white female in their 90s. In addition to that, there are an another 13 deaths to report tonight through the Metro Health Postmortem Surveillance Program with the Bear County Medical Examiner's Office. This is one of the few programs like it in the country, and it allows Metro Health to collaborate with medical examiners examiner's office to better understand the impact of COVID-19 in our community. You may have seen national reports previously over the last few months about uh, deaths related to COVID-19 that were not tested, and this is one way we can get at that data. If a person passes away and has a reported and has a reported history of signs and symptoms of COVID-19, but lacks documentation of a test being done, the medical examiner in partnership with Metro Health tests them post-mortem and reports findings to Metro Health. This process takes a little bit of time to validate. These deaths occurred over the last three weeks, and Metro Health now verifies all that data reported to confirm that there are no duplicate cases reported. So these are deaths, again, that occurred over the last three weeks that were now validated post-mortem, lacked a test, but now we can determine the cause of death. Demographic data from the postmortem program is reported in aggregate, not separately, but you can see the comprehensive data on our website, covid19.sanantonio.gov. But I do have to mention, and we say this every night, behind every data point is a person with a life lived. Our hearts are with their families, their friends, and their loved ones. Our hospital systems tonight remain under high stress. We do have 1,216 people in the hospital, which is up 11 from yesterday. There are 399 people in ICU, which is no change from yesterday, and 231 on ventilators, which is down one from yesterday. So that's a significant stress on our hospital system, but I do want to mention that the acceleration of data that we've been seeing over the last few weeks is starting to slow, which is a good sign. However, I do want to also mention that we now have 35% of all hospital admissions are COVID-19 patients. And at this point, we have 35%, excuse me, 45% of ventilators available and 11% of hospital beds available. I'll turn it over now to Commissioner Rodriguez. 
Thank you, Mayor. And of course, we also join in uh, offering our prayers and, and sympathies to uh, the lives lost uh, recently. Um, it also underscores the severity of the situation. Um, I had the opportunity this past week to visit um, the Freeman Coliseum. As we all know, uh, those that have been in this community for a long time, the Freeman is kind of a center for emergency operations and has been, uh, whether it's for a storm-related event, hurricane, uh, evacuees have, have uh, assembled there. Uh, currently, the uh, Freeman is set up for um, overflow space for our hospital system, which has been mentioned has been stressed out uh, or close to being stressed out. Uh, we have about 80 beds that are set up at Freeman, uh, but capacity to set up up to 200 um, over the next few weeks. So uh, for me, it was a stark reminder as I visited that uh, we certainly are not out of the woods and we're towing a very dangerous line here of having to activate um, our, our hospital beds at Freeman. Uh, the other thing I want to mention uh, quickly that the county is working on, uh, we know the last few months have been very trying on everyone, particularly as it relates to our mental health. We're working on two initiatives at the county in conjunction with our partners at the Center for Healthcare Services. Uh, the first is a mental health initiative for frontline uh, workers, our healthcare workers, and their families. Uh, we know that uh, no one has been under greater stress over the last few months than those who are treating and caring for our COVID patients. Um, this will uh, obviously impact uh, not just the nurses, the clinicians, the doctors, but their families. So we're working on an initiative to assist their uh, mental health. The second is an enhancement to our mobile uh, crisis outreach team through the Center for Healthcare Services, which responds to calls through our 24-hour crisis hotline. Um, we have trained professionals there who are can help with intervention um, and, and also reduce interventions by law enforcement and inpatient hospitalization. So um, important note on that is it also does include the children's mobile outreach team. We know our young people are not immune from the mental health pressures and stresses, particularly as we contemplate whether or not uh, they're going back to school in a, I guess, traditional uh, setting this fall. Uh, so for those um, children, please, uh, family members, if you're in need, you have any questions or doubts about whether your kids are being impacted, uh, please call the hotline number, which is 210-223-SAFE, S-A-F-E. Thank you, Mayor. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Rodriguez. And I do want to report testing numbers continue to be up. We had over 1,000 tests conducted yesterday at Freeman. Uh, also tests being conducted at uh, Cuellar Center, uh, Scobie Middle School, Kazan Middle School, also very active uh, in our testing regimen. Uh, before we go over to questions, uh, I want to remind you that you can get text updates on COVID-19 in our community by texting COSAGOV to 55000. You can also check the website at covid19.sanantonio.com. Gov. Uh, Dr. Wu is here, and Dr. Wu has uh, been County Commissioner Justin Rodriguez saying, quote, we are towing a very dangerous line when it comes to stressing out our hospital system. And he's specifically talking about what he saw at Freeman Coliseum. Uh, 80 beds set up, ready to go in case we run out of staffed hospital beds in San Antonio hospitals, and 200 more can be set up as well. He was talking about uh, coming face to face with the situation at Freeman. And as far as the numbers that the mayor unveiled today, 954 new cases of COVID-19 in our area. We now have uh, six new deaths, a total of 165, but also 13 post-mortem surveillance program deaths that were revealed uh, through work that the uh, medical examiner has done. And this is uh, a first that I can remember him talking yeah. about this. It's a program that now allows people, uh, the medical examiner, to examine people post-mortem who may have had symptoms of COVID-19 but did not actually get a test to document a positive case. So all in all, now 165 deaths with those 13 from postmortem examination. Yeah, and there was a national study done. I, I, I want to say it was the Washington Post or the New York Times that talked about the fact that in Houston in particular, people are dying at home. Yes. And they don't necessarily have anybody with them. They don't necessarily have you know any way to get help. So they're dying at home. They're not sure what the cause is. And they examine them and realize it was a COVID-related death. So 
that's kind of what is playing out, I think, here in Bear County that we're seeing as well. And just a little bit of a bright spot in the information uh, that was released today, the acceleration of data, the acceleration in these numbers that is slowing down. But again, as we have heard from the mayor multiple times throughout the week, that slowdown is reflected weeks after the fact. Uh, so that's always something that has a two week window for us to see whether that increase or that decrease remains the same. Yeah, we'll talk to infectious disease doctor Ruth Berger and coming up a little bit later in in this show and she can kind of tell us what she thinks about the trends. Are we plateauing at all in what we're seeing? All right, it is a warm one outside Katie. It is uh, your weather team here may start sounding like broken records over the next few days because the heat is the big story and yeah, it's summer in Texas. We expect it to be hot, but we'll see some uh, near record high temperatures over the next few days. And it's so important as you're remembering to take care of yourselves and your neighbors in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic. Also remember to take care of yourselves and your neighbors in terms of this heat, because if you spend too much time outside and you overdo it and you're not properly hydrated uh, can make you sick. So just make sure and especially checking on neighbors uh, that may not have the most reliable air conditioning systems and things like that. Just to, uh, you know, make sure your community is doing okay in this heat because it is going to stay hot here in the short term. No uh, good relief in sight. 98 the air temperature in San Antonio, but it feels like 102. 112 is the feels like temperature in Del Rio. 111 the heat index in Catula. A similar number there in Beeville. So why are those heat index numbers so high? Our dew point numbers are high. The good news is as we get into the weekend, dew point numbers should drop off a bit in the afternoon. So that will help to shave a few degrees off of the heat index or what it feels like to our bodies. But the air temperatures will still be well into the triple digits. So a lot of heat coming your way the next few days. And that'll be true this evening as well. A slow drop in temperatures through the 90s under mostly clear skies. But we've got a nice breeze in place this evening and that will hang around for the rest of the day. So that's a little bit of good news. Uh, high temperatures today. We did make it up to 99 in San Antonio. That should refresh here very soon. Uh, even hotter off to the south and to the west. Elsewhere across the state, plenty of triple digits in that hot pink color up in the Texas panhandle. And it's not just us here in South Texas. It is going to be the entire Lone Star State and even the good southern portion of the United States. We'll be looking at some big time heat as we get into the weekend and early next week because the heat high not going anywhere it is going to hug a lot of us very closely as we get into early next week and that'll keep our high temperatures pretty elevated. So tomorrow a lot like today, we'll see some cloud cover in the morning, starting off near 80 degrees, very humid. 101, your forecast high temperature tomorrow afternoon, and then it's Sunday into Monday of next week. 105, the forecast high. That would break records for both of those days. Not necessarily something that we want to do, but hopefully we're getting this uh, big summertime heat wave out of the way a little bit early. Guys, wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm fine not breaking those records. Yeah, we're not going for it. Yeah. Thanks, Katie. Don't think they're going to ask me, though. <laughs> All right, we have sports coming up next. The Spurs are now in Orlando where they'll get tested and then self-isolate for the next 36 to 48 hours before they can resume life and the season restart inside the NBA bubble. Once play starts back up, the Spurs will have a minimum of eight games to make the postseason. They could force a play-in if they end up ninth and four games behind the eighth seed. Now, whatever happens, they will have to do it without their second leading scorer, LaMarcus Aldridge, who's recovering from shoulder surgery. It's unfortunate, you know, we, we missed L.A. earlier this this year a couple of times as well. Um, I don't think it will hinder us because of that reason, because we he's been out before and, um, you know, we, we kind of had to play without him. Um, you know, he's definitely going to be a loss, you know, as far as the team team wise, though, you know, with his leadership and stuff like that. Um, but I think everybody's going to be able to step up, you know, me particularly. You know, I've had to, you know, endure some of his minutes and I think it showed, you know, in a positive way. But, um, you know, hopefully as a whole, as a group, we can, you know, go out there and fill, fill his void and, you know, make things happen. L.A. missed 10 games this season, including seven straight in late February, early March, while dealing with a right rotator cuff issue. Drafted in 2016 by the Houston Astros, right-handed pitcher Forrest Whitley is trying to make the big club this season. Yesterday, during his live batting practice session, he caught the eye of skipper Dusty Baker, who said that's the best he's ever seen Whitley and that he's impressed with him. Forrest is one of 56 players trying to make the opening day roster, and he knows all eyes are on him. It was a real honor to be up, be back out there on that mound. It's been since the exhibition game since I've been back out there. Um, but yeah, I felt great. Uh, everything was coming out really well. I was throwing things for strikes. I was throwing my slider for a strike, my curveball for a strike. 
Uh, my changeup was getting down when I needed it to. I pretty much checked off all the boxes uh, for my first live BP uh, since pretty much uh, spring training, actually. So I was really happy with how everything went and just kind of take that momentum to the next one. Score on a little After spring training was canceled in March, Whitley lost 30 pounds and now weighs around 206. At six foot seven, he said he likes this weight better. Up in Arlington, the Texas Rangers are going through the drills as they prep for the shortened 60 game regular season. Now this is a special campaign for them because of their new ballpark, $1.2 billion globe live field right across the street from their old house. The guys are using this time to adjust to their new field. The field itself is immaculate. I can't say enough about the field itself. Um, you know, the indoor 72, I, I honestly worry that we're going to have a little bit of a, a heat stroke when we get into 90 degree weather, you know, when we go to LA or something. It's funny to say that in Texas, but uh, it's the truth. I mean, it's my office is cold, the, the field is almost chilly. You know, then I walk outside and it's 100 degrees. So we don't have to deal with that, which is a beautiful thing. The Rangers will open the season at home July 24th with the Rockies and likely without fans, at least on the opening homestand. Guys. Thank you, Larry. Thanks, you got Larry. it. <laughs> Dr. Ruth Bergeron up next. It is Thursday, and that's when we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Ruth Bergeron from the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio, an infectious disease doctor. Doctor, thank you for joining us. Uh, you're as plugged in to some of the data that we've been seeing as anybody in the city and county right now. What is the data telling you? Are you seeing hopeful signs, or are you still thinking we haven't reached that peak yet? Right. So it's a mixed bag. Um, let me start with a reality check. You know, we, we use a model. I've shown you examples of how that model predicts our curve um, in the coming weeks. And it's from a very, very reputable company that works with a lot of academic medical centers around the country to help with strategic planning. And we call it the SG2 model. Our SG2 model is suggesting that we are just about at peak but that we are going to stay at the peak. So can think of it as a high plateau. And we may stay at this level until about the end of July to early August. So this is, it, the good news is we don't seem to be rising, rising, rising at 10% per day as was happening in the recent weeks. Um, with the, the rate of rise has slowed, has leveled off. But you know our hospitals are just about at their capacity. And the, it, the model predicts that we're going to stay there for the next two, even three weeks. So this means we cannot back off. It means that the measures we've been taking by raising awareness um, and asking people to uh, prevent and protect and provide information to the contact tracers, those three Ps, that campaign is having an effect but we're not out of the woods and we cannot let our guard down. And we're still not two weeks out from the July 4th holiday weekend. Why is that something that's important for us to just continue to slow down, maintain these precautions, keep those up? Uh, why is that timeline something that we really need to be cautious about? So we, we, our model that I just described for you with my words is actually taking into account the possibility that 4th of July resulted in some increased exposures. But because people don't actually become ill enough to go to the hospital with COVID until about two weeks after they were infected, um, we still worry that anything that happened on July 4th wouldn't be evident from the hospital perspective until about the 18th or beyond of July. Okay, so we're talking like probably about 10 days, nine days from now when we'll start seeing some of the effects of the fourth weekend. Okay, talk about um, schools and schools reopening and some, you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics had some recommendations, the CDC had some recommendations. What do you, what are your thoughts about schools reopening in either in-person or uh, distance learning? Right. Well, I am in line with the American Academy of Pediatrics, and I think for many, many reasons, school needs to be available. Um, many families uh, don't have alternative options. They can't do uh, expensive stay-home schooling. They, they need child care. They need their kids to go to school so they can go to work, and we all understand how critical that is for the economy. So I believe in school, but we need to have it be done safely. And there are many measures that could be implemented 
at individual schools and in individual classrooms that could really increase the safety of sending kids back to school. And I think we're going to work hard as a community to get the word out there and do a lot of education of both parents, well, and their children, families and schools and teachers to see how we can do this as safely as possible. What do you think safely as possible looks like right now from your perspective? What would you like to see happen in schools? So let's remember the, the principles of how we mitigate infectious risk with, with COVID-19. And we ask the question, how many, how close, how long, and how modifiable? Those four questions. How many people are you with? How close are you to them? How long are you in close proximity? And how modifiable is the activity? And so for every single thing that's being done in a school, those four questions should be asked. So reducing classroom sizes, increasing the space between the kids and uh, looking at what kind of activities are being done. We don't want singing and we don't want wind instruments and we don't want close contact sports. Uh, we would love to see small groups, small classes being uh, carried out, say, in large spaces such as gymnasiums or even if it's cool enough, if there's a shady place, having classes outdoors. We don't want to see groups of kids intermingling. So we want to see a small group of kids that are staying with the same group and the same teacher all day long without um, mixing through the rest of the institution. We want to see them eating their lunches in their classroom and bringing their lunch from home. We'd like to see staggered drop off and pick up times so that we don't have areas of congestion where people are shoulder to shoulder coming into or going out of the school. And of course, hand hygiene needs to be everywhere. Ideally, masking. And this is going to be tough for the smaller children, but there may be other options that can really help us for those kindergartners and those first graders who might find it scary to be in a classroom full of masked people where there are now face shields that come down over then go to below the chin and around the sides of the face and, and cover the eyes. Those are not as good. They're not as protective as the face mask, but they do provide some protection. And there is some scientific evidence of that. And that might be some sort of an interim measure, especially for the younger kids that would help make them safer. Unfortunately, when we go back to the data, I, we've been seeing a number of deaths over the last you know, week or so that have been way more than we've seen in the past. And today they included 13 deaths that were uh, previously unreported that were part of a post-mortem report. Is that a trend that you think we're going to continue to see? Well, it's un unfortunately, um, there will be deaths. You know, when we have this high occupancy rate of our hospitals, uh, with people that are really sick, you are going to see some deaths. We try to mitigate that risk by implementing the, our new knowledge of how to use a steroid called dexamethasone, how to use the antiviral drug remdesivir. But even remdesivir is in very short supply, and we have been learning how to use it most effectively. If we use it too early before a person has a real oxygen deficit, then we may be wasting it because those might be people that would have gotten better on their own. And if we wait too late, if somebody's already been intubated or needing ECMO, that extracorporeal membrane oxygenation support, at that point in time, it's usually too late. So we need to identify um, who could benefit best from this. And that requires a lot of good judgment and requires a lot of timely responsiveness in our emergency room. So all of these things have to come together nicely and in an organized and synchronized fashion for us to reduce mortality. And you know, of course, if the hospitals are overwhelmed, if the emergencies are overrun, it's hard to synchronize everything and do things in, in a timely way. Dr. Ruth Berger in the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio. As always, thanks for being with us this evening. Happy to be with you. We'll be right back. In the buzz today, it's a little too early to be thinking about Halloween candy for most of us, unless you're a company that sells a lot of candy like Hershey. The candy company is showing off its offerings for the upcoming spooky holiday, including cookies and cream fangs. Vampire kisses with the red strawberry flavored cream inside. Witches brew Kit Kat with a crunchy marshmallowy concoction and Reese's Franken cups with a green cream. <laughs> Don't worry, the fan favorites will be back like the Reese's peanut butter pumpkins, the Kit Kat pumpkin pie miniature and the glow in the dark assortment.
Ooh. Yeah. This Thursday could be a little sweeter if you just get yourself a cookie. From candy to cookies, today is National Sugar Cookie Day. The recipe pretty straightforward. Flour, butter, eggs, vanilla, either baking powder, baking soda, and of course sugar, including a little bit on top. Yeah, the so-called cookie of champions was born here in the United <laughs> States in Nazareth, Pennsylvania. I did not know it was called the cookie of champions. I didn't either, but I'll take it. Yeah, apparently the sugar cookie was cooked up in the mid 1700s by German Protestants who called it the Nazareth cookie. It's a big deal in Pennsylvania. They adopted the sugar cookie as the official cookie of the Commonwealth. That's not just a proclamation. It was a house bill passed by lawmakers. Well, I they like, are serious. <laughs> I like the, the just steadfast dedication to that one. Absolutely. And you know what? Yeah. I bet it's not too early for uh, someone in this studio to be thinking no, about no, Halloween. No, 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 no. Katie no, no, Blake. No, 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 bring it on. We need all the fall Halloween stuff earlier <laughs> to kind of lift of spirits, I see. You are, you are a fall fanatic. I say go for it, yeah. And it is feeling anything but fall-like out there. We are smack dab in the middle of a summer heat wave. 99, the official high temperature of the airport in San Antonio, but we'll be straying a bit above that over the next few days. So the heat rolls on, but we're not just gonna talk about how hot it is here in summer in South Texas. We've got watering restrictions kicking in tomorrow and Tropical Storm Fay formed this afternoon. Details coming up in the full forecast. All right, it's the time of year when we ask, did we hit the triple digits today? <laughs> I checked, okay, officially we haven't. I'm always curious what my phone says. Uh -oh. oh, Katie, how do you feel about that? Come on. <laughs> You're really gonna do that right now? I was in a good mood. Do not- Oh, I didn't, uh, is this, this is a, a sore spot. You have a weather center at This your is disposal. a sore spot. I've, this is, okay, sorry. It's like my, my mom, like, but my app, my Apple, out app says it's going to be blank. <laughs> no offense, mom. It's not really how you sound, but Pace Hot Weather app is the is the way to go because we put all that all right. information in there ourselves. It's not just a computer spitting out stuff. So. I just was looking for other opinions. Just look at the case out with another opinion. You may want a second opinion. Katie, on, I am here on, for you. Carry on with your forecast. You may want a second opinion on this forecast. I, I'm, I'm not going to lie, and we'll get to the heat in just a second. But I do want to update you on what's going on in the tropics. All things considered, pretty quiet across most of the Atlantic Basin, but a little bit closer to the east coast of the United States. Our next tropical storm developed this afternoon. This is Tropical Storm Fay that formed off the coast of the Carolinas. This is significant because this is the earliest that a... F named storm or the sixth name storm of the season has developed on record in the Atlantic Basin. So it is significant for that reason. Thankfully, Faye will not have uh, big unfortunate effects on parts of the northeastern United States. Maximum sustained winds 45 miles per hour. Center of circulation is here off the coast of North Carolina. Movement is north at eight miles per hour. This will bring tropical storm conditions and in terms of winds to parts of the northeast United States and New England here over the next couple of days. Tomorrow afternoon this will be inching closer to the New Jersey coastline continuing to move north through parts of New England as we get into late Friday early on Saturday. Several inches of rain possible here. A little bit of storm surge uh, and some tropical storm force winds, but that will not be affecting our forecast. But Faye uh, did make history this afternoon back here at home. Our focus remains solely on the heat and also the drought conditions that are beginning to sneak in. Here's a look at the aquifer level since June 1st, a steady, pretty much steady decline. Unfortunately, today's level 658.1 uh, is down. The 10 day average is down below that 660 mark as well. So tomorrow, stage one watering restrictions go into place for all saws customers. So that means can only water one day of the week depending on what number your street address ends in. And you can access this on kset.com. It's there for you. Keep in mind, you can water before 11 a.m. after 7 p.m. and handheld watering is allowed any day, any time. So unfortunately, these watering restrictions could be around for a bit as the heat high hugs us close. We don't have any chance of rain in the planning forecast, and it does look like this heat high could keep us dry uh, even into 
not this coming weekend, but even the weekend after that. It looks like we'll see our temperatures peak near 105 Sunday into Monday. The only kind of good news here is that our dew points, this lower number here, those numbers will start to drop off a bit in the afternoons this weekend and early next week. So that's going to help to take a little bit of the edge off the heat index. That's not the case today. Our dew point temperatures, temperatures stayed elevated and that kept our heat indices very high. Feels like 112 in Del Rio. That's the yellow number feeling like 102 here in San Antonio feeling like 107 in Beeville. So tonight only dropping down to near 80 degrees, becoming mostly cloudy by dawn tomorrow morning. But just like today, we'll see plenty of sun in the afternoon. High temperature around 101. Heat index could generally be anywhere between about 105 and 110 tomorrow afternoon. As far as your air temperatures are concerned, 101 here in town, upper 90s on the coast. But again, maybe above 105 to 110 for your air temperature off to the west tomorrow afternoon. And it'll be Sunday into Monday that we could potentially break some records as far as our high temperatures are concerned. As soon as it looks like this is going to back off, we'll let you know. Guys. By the way, the KSAT weather app is great. I will say that. Thank you. <laughs> we'll be right back. Got it right here. <laughs> News around America now, a tale of two rulings from the Supreme Court on the tax returns of President Donald Trump. First, the court ruled that the president can be subpoenaed by a New York prosecutor who also wants to view his financial returns. But those will probably stay a secret as part of a grand jury investigation. However, the high court is blocking Congress from seeing the president's financial records for now. That court sent that back to a lower court, which likely means the records will be hidden from Congress until after the November election. We'll be right back. That is all our time. Thanks for watching the news at six. See you right back here on the night beat at 10.